Hello, fellow intellectuals. Professor Dustin here, and I hope you all are doing great. If not, I hope this video can help in any way possible, whether that's sleep, focus, or just relaxing. And for today, we're going to do something a little bit different than we have in the past. There was a kind of a suggestion from a fellow Tingalectual. I'm going to put their comment right here, as you can see, and just the portion that they mentioned this, but they wanted me to read some poetry. So I figured, let's read The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. One of my favorites, personally, but pretty famous, too, as most of you may know. So, before we begin, I wanted to give you a little bit of information about the poet, Edgar Allan Poe. As well as, when we're done with that, some information that you would need to better enjoy the poem as I'm reading it. So we'll do that ahead of time. But before we get any of that started... All this will cost is one little click or tap on the like button below this video. It really does help the channel, and it allows this to get out to more intellectuals such as yourself. Have you done that? Great. All right. So, let us begin this session. And you may learn something here, or maybe not. Maybe you'll just... Get some reiteration of what you already know. Emphasis. Either way. Let's begin. So, Edgar Allan Poe is one of the earliest practitioners in the country of the United States of America of the short story, the literary form, the short story. And he is also considered to be the inventor of the detective fiction. Okay. There's a couple things there. Now, actually, some crazy facts about Mr. Poe. At the age of 26, Poe had married his 13-year-old cousin, Virginia. Now, before you go and judge, remember, this is the early 1800s when all of this is happening in America, or United States of America, I should specify. So, this wasn't exactly unseen, and most people didn't live very long. So, just understand the climate of the situation. Definitely not doing that today. Oh God, don't do that today. It's not allowed. Okay. Unfortunately, his cousin, Virginia, had passed away from tuberculosis 11 years after their marriage. So, it's tragic. Now, he had lived a financially difficult life and career since he earned a living from writing alone. Whether that was critiques or his poems, his short stories, in all writing. And back in the 1800s, not very common to live on your craft when it comes to the arts. Just, it was probably harder then than it is now. And uh, this was after he had a falling out with the military and his adoptive family, which I believe were other members of his family. But I'm getting all these facts from Wikipedia and it doesn't really specify to whom. Was the family, was it uncle, was it a cousin? I, it does says the Allens, so anyway. So finally, unfortunately, Poe had passed away at the age, the young age of 40. But here's the interesting part. His death was a bit of a mystery because all of the medical records from the time are gone. The last thing we do know about his death is that 
he was in a bit of a mental stupor or a mental state that just was kooky. He needed to go to a hospital. And when he got to the hospital, he ended up passing away. But nobody really knows officially what the cause of death was. Was it suicidal? Was it alcoholism? Did, did someone do it to him? He wasn't wearing his own clothes, you know, at the time of his death. So it's hard to say. But there you have it. Now, I believe there is an award given out literary to, to literary folks. Um, I believe it's called the Edgar Award. I think it's the Poe Award. Could be any of those. It's, it's, it's after him. But you get that award if you do well. You write a mystery novel or mystery genre really well. You can get that award. So there you have it. All the facts about Edgar Allan Poe that I, I found personally pretty interesting and I, I thought you'd like to. Now, we're going to go ahead and cover some terms that are in the poem that if you don't know the reference, the alliterations, I believe it is, it, it can be very difficult to enjoy the poem as much as I want you to. So let's tackle those next. The first is there's a reference to Palas. It's like Dallas with a P for Peter. Pronunciated Palas. It's Greek, but there's basically a couple of different references. The main one is that it's another name for the Greek goddess Athena. And it's kind of blurry on how Athena got this other name, this other title, if you will, nickname. One theory is that it was Athena's adoptive sister. She was adopted into a family under Triton, and his daughter, her name was Pallas. And Athena took on the name to honor her adoptive sister. I like that version better, but then again, I'm also a fan of the God of War series, so this other theory is that when Athena had, as it's said in the Wikipedia article, flayed, so just killed essentially, the giant named Pallas, she brutally used the skin of the giant on her shield, and somehow that became her nickname. Balas after the giant. So it's not 100% on which of those two she got the name Balas, but know that when it refers to Balas in this poem, it's Athena's nickname. So the goddess Athena from Greek mythology. Okay, next up is Plutonian, referring to, well, probably Pluto, but I digress. It's specifically going to be the name of the Roman god of the underworld. It references a couple of times in the poem, Plutonian shores. You'll hear that. Know that it's referring to the underworld where evil things should go or you know, dead things, you know, that kind of thing. So when he references that, know that's what he means. Uh, two more things. The next one is the bomb of Galid. There's actually a biblical reference I believe it's in Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. And there was an ointment that would heal. And it was called the Bomb of Galib, because that's where the ointment came from. It's referenced, I think this is one of the only times before its time. I think it was the first. I could be wrong on that, but where it referenced it from the Bible in another literary work. So he'll be talking about that. Anytime he references anything wonderful, it's to get back to his love, Lenore, the teller of the story, the main character, his love is Lenore. And anytime he references anything beautiful or wonderful, a paradise, a heaven, if you will, it's to be with Lenore again since she has passed. He doesn't tell you how, we just know she's not there amongst him anymore. Okay, finally. There's a reference to Aden, A-I-D-E-N-N, -N, for the spelling. And this is another biblical reference. It merely is another name for the Garden of Eden. And again, just saying how much and how he long 
things to be with his love, Lenore. Okay, so there you go. A little bit of information about the poet, so you can understand where he's coming from in the very early to mid-1800s. And also, uh, well, it's for the language, I should say. And then also the very specific alliterations and references to other literary works that were big at the time that he's trying to beautifully craft into this poem. So, that being said, let me go get the poem. It's in my briefcase. Give me just one moment. Oh, yes. Uh, briefcase tapping, of course. full of Edgar Allan Poe poems. I bought this a really long time ago when I was very young, unbeknownst to myself that I would really love to read these later when I better understood the material. But at, at the young age, I just I thought it looked cool. <laughs> anyway, I put my briefcase away real quick. Just a moment. to the page where we can begin. I believe it's 36, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, there it is. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Let's begin. <clears throat> Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume, forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of some one gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly, I wished the morrow. Vainly, I had sought to borrow. From my books, surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Nameless here forevermore. And the silken sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating an entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, I said, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you, here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wandering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was whispered word, This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, 
somewhat louder than before. Surely, I said, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he. But with mine of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon the bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou, I said, art thou no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore? Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore what this grim, ungainly, ghastly got, an ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamp light gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamp light gloating o'er, she shall pass, ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried. Thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff, this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate, Yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm of Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. 
Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil. By that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it still clasp a saint, sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest of the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all this the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws a shadow on the floor and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore that was the raven by edgar Allan poe i hope that you've enjoyed this reading of this very famous poem i know i enjoyed reading it to you and hopefully everything will be fine for you after this video. And if you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing and hitting the little bell notification so you can get more videos just like this. All right. Well, let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this and want to see more poetry or maybe short stories. Either way, with the information and everything, let me know your thoughts, your feedback. It truly is a gift and it helps us make this better, the videos better as we proceed forward future. But for now, this has been Professor Dustin wishing you well. Professor ASM. Thank you for watching. Hopefully, if you're sleeping, it's wonderful dreams you're having and whether it is morning noon or night i hope that it's a great one okay i'll see you again in a future video for now bye